Yes, yes, okay, good. Is the volume all right? Okay.
Good. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So suppose we have constructed such complete notice. It's a complete set of states which are eigenvectors of this unitary operator with eigenvalues given by this phase factor here. Now, these objects are called the Floquet modes. Okay? They are not related to the Hamiltonian, but rather to the evolution operator. And this object here is called the quasi-energy. For obvious reason, in some sense, it is pretty much what the energy would do in a time-independent problem. But now the problem is time-dependent. Mm? Now, a warning. Epsilon j suffer from a certain kind of indeterminacy, pretty much the same indeterminacy that you have if I tell you that I have a complex number of unit modulus. What is theta? Well, theta is the law, is related to the log of z, but as you know, it's undetermined by an integer multiple of 2 pi. Okay? There is no way that you can tell me which theta. Theta plus 2 pi n is as well as theta. Hmm? Therefore, in some sense, you realize that if I take epsilon j and I substitute with epsilon j plus m h bar omega, omega, <coughs> I remind you, is the frequency associated to the period, okay? In the standard way. Mm. So suppose that I take these phases that appear there mm, and I add an integer multiple of h bar omega. What happens to this phase factor? Well, something trivial happens. You see, this transforms into e to the minus i epsilon j plus m h bar omega times t over h bar, okay, which is e to the minus i epsilon j t, the original phase factor, times e to the minus i m h bar goes omega t. Mm? But omega t is 2 pi, okay? So this is in fact a factor 1. So does it really matter? I could add an integer multiple of h bar omega to my quasi-energies, and the thing should be the same. Hmm? Uh, this uh, brings a little bit of a headache in some sense, because it would, be <coughs> it would be nice to think, at least this is what a physicist would do, to think that somehow this evolution operator f, so this um, uh, u of t0 plus t, t0, the one period thing, is e to the minus i over h bar, some Floquet Hamiltonian, so-called, times t. Okay, it would be nice, but I should put some quotation marks in here. Uh, why? Well, essentially, you might say, of course, I mean, any unitary can be written as e to the minus i, some emission operator. So, in fact, if you read this equation, you realize that I expect that this Hermitian Hamiltonian, when acting on ujt0, gives you just epsilon j, ujt0. So somehow, the Floquet Hamiltonian, quotation marks, is an Hermitian operator such that the Floquet modes are the eigenvectors of it with eigenvalues epsilon j. Now, in the light of what I told you about this indeterminacy, you realize that this is a bit stretched. At least a mathematician would certainly kill me on the spot. Okay? And there are several issues related to this. It's not just a question of being... Uh, I mean, certainly, the eigenvalues are only defined modulo h bar omega. But also, you immediately realize, suppose that I have a Hamiltonian with local operator, okay? and I drive things. Now, the evolution operator over a period might be a very non-local object. Okay? So the log of this object, which is somehow the thing that appears there, is in principle a non-local object. Okay? So it's somehow 
hard to make sense and, 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 and think in, in simple terms, okay? Might be very non-local in space in terms of the elementary local objects of your thing. Well, then there is obviously a mathematician close by that might exist. How do you know that this Hermitian operator can be really defined in the thermodynamic limit and such and such, okay? So can it be really defined? Now, there are subtle mathematical questions related to the spectral representations of these objects, which are somehow trivialized somewhat when your Hilbert space is finite. Think of your favorite lattice model on a finite, okay? Then really the Hamiltonian is an n-dimensional, finite dimensional uh, operator in some complex finite dimension. Well, C to the N, okay? So, in some sense, at that point, you are dealing with matrices and things become a little bit more mild in, this, in terms of the spectral thing. But if you approach the thermodynamic limit or if your model is on the continuum, things can be a headache, okay? I can anticipate. Okay. <clears throat> What? <coughs> uh, um, not really, but the because I mean, you, if you change t zero, you can essentially transform things with a unitary transformation, and the eigenvalues do not depend, but the states do depend. So here, the states do depend on t zero. Okay, and in some sense, also here, I should remind of these things by writing that this Hamiltonian is depending on the initial choice, okay? So the energies and the quasi-energies do not, but the states would be unitarily changed, okay? Good. <clears throat> now, all this, all right. Now let me just, let me just uh, uh, finish the proof of the statement B with the following seemingly strange construction. <clears throat> Take U of T, T0, okay? The unitary operator for time T0 to time T. And write it in the following way. U of T, T0, E to the plus I over H bar, the Floquet Hamiltonian times t minus t0 times e to the minus i h bar, the Floquet Hamiltonian, t minus t0, okay? I have seemingly done a stupid thing, plus and minus the same object. But there is a reason for that. The operator that appears here is pretty interesting. Let's call it p t t0. p stands for periodic, okay? So what I want to show is that this periodic part, which multiplies the other thing, is indeed periodic, sorry. <laughs> I want to show that this is periodic. Now, <clears throat> so let's see. First of all, P of T0, T0, okay? So it would be U of T0, T0 times E to the plus Z, E0, okay? So th this is unitary unit by, by, it's very simple. But what about P of T0 plus T? Okay, so if I evolve up to a time T, well, then I have U of T0 plus T times T0 times E to the plus I over H bar, the Floquet Hamiltonian times a period T, okay? But this object is the evolution operator over one period. So it's e to the minus i hf t over h bar. And this is e plus i, the same thing, right? So you would agree with me that this will also be unitary. Unit, sorry, not unit. It's always unitary. But in particular, it's unit. And by doing one step more, which you will find in the notes, it's very simple, but I have no time to do it, you can prove that pretty in general, this is verified, okay? So if I sum a time t to the final time, it's the same thing as 
the initial thing. So periodic, as promised. OK, <clears throat> nice. So the splitting of the evolution operator is uh, useful. First of all, let's do a simpler dynamical exercise. So suppose that I take the initial uj at time t0, the Floquet modes, and I evolve for n periods. Okay? So I want to know the state that I obtain at time t0 plus nt. To do it, I should operate with the evolution operator for an integer number of steps, okay? which is, if you remember, u of t0 plus t, t0 applied n times. Hmm? But remember that these are eigenstates of this object with eigenvalue equal the face is written there. Okay? So this object here is actually very, very simple. It's e to the minus i, the phase, times nt, the same state. OK? So starting from my Floquet mode, I, ap I apply the evolution for n periods, and I obtain the same mode times a phase. Quite a simple thing. Uh, now, what about a more general t? So, suppose that I now want psi j at a generic time t. What should I do? Apply t t0 to the initial state, right? So, I start always from the initial flow case mode. And I apply, sorry, the notation. Yesterday, someone was concerned about the notation. Now, u with the hat is the unitary operator. This is the periodic part of the state, which I call, by the way, u to remind you of the periodic part of block states in solids. But, um, OK. Good. So now, <clears throat> use this rewriting of the evolution operator. So is this, this is equal to a periodic part, t, t0, times e to the minus i, the Hamiltonian, t minus t0, OK? Applied to uj of t0. All right, but uj of t0 is a negative state quotation marks of this object with eigenvalue epsilon j, OK? Which means that this is nothing but e to the minus i epsilon j, I can substitute the eigenvalue and take it out, t minus t0. And then all I have is the periodic unitary operator applied to uj of t0. Okay? And this object here, I will call uj of t. Okay? It's by definition a state that starts from t0 and evolves in time in a periodic fashion, OK? Because of this property, then you have that uh, precisely, uh, precisely this the statement follows. Therefore, what we have achieved is, sorry, I didn't mean to cancel this, precisely this equation, OK? So I have constructed for you a state that is obtained by evolving some initial state, so by definition, a solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And such a state has the form of a phase factor with a quasi energy times a periodic state. Is it clear? Okay? It's not really difficult. Um, now, uh, okay. Uh, by the way, a small, a, a small comment on this indeterminacy that you have here. You might say, what do I do if I change my mind and I just uh, substitute this epsilon j plus m h bar omega to the originally chosen epsilon j? Well, nothing really happens. You can reabsorb, it, it would take little to show, that if I substitute here epsilon j plus m h bar omega, I can reabsorb this part 
into this function by redefining it, and it's still periodic, okay? So by an appropriate redefinition of the periodic part, I can reabsorb the indeterminacy in the quasi-energy, okay? So, I mean, it's simple and it's spelled out in the notes, so I don't think I should waste more time here, okay? So, a consequence of all, quite interesting, in fact, now, this is um, uh, a kind of useful thing. So, suppose that I start <coughs> uh, having some system prepared uh, with some Hamiltonian um, uh, C0, and I prepared it, for instance, in the ground state of this Hamiltonian H0, okay? And at time T0, I start driving it periodically. So here, the Hamiltonian becomes periodic and becomes H of T, okay? Obviously, <coughs> since the modes are a complete basis set, I can always re-express the initial state, whatever it is, be it the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian or any state, in fact, I can rewrite it as sum over the modes of uj t0, uj t0, okay? I have inserted the completeness, identity, hmm? times psi zero, okay? These coefficients here are just the overlaps, I call it them C cj, the overlap of the initial state on the flow k modes. Hmm? So I write like this, sum over j, cj, uj, t0, okay? So I took my initial state and I expanded it in the basis of the flow k modes. Now, <clears throat> the evolution comes for free almost. So psi of t, which is the u t t0, the initial state, is equal to the sum over j, cj, the evolution operator, applied to the flow k mode, which I know what it is, hmm? because it's essentially the flow k states, psi, these are called flow k states, to distinguish them by, uh, from the modes by the fact that they have a phase and also a periodic uh, part, okay? So this object here can be rewritten as sum over j, cj, e to the minus i, epsilon j, t minus t0 times uj of t, okay? This is a remarkable thing. The dynamics of my initial state at any arbitrary time can be decomposed in the following way. Hmm? Now, those of you who are acquainted with quantum quenches will recognize a similarity, okay? When you do quantum quenches, what you do is that you start from some initial Hamiltonian, some state of the initial Hamiltonian, to some final Hamiltonian that is changed, is H. Mm? And to H, you associate states phi j with Eigen's energies Ej, okay? And then you would repeat exactly the same exercise that you see there, except that here you would have Ej, and here you would get the time-independent eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, okay? So all it changes is that the phases are governed by the quasi-energies, and the states that appear there have a periodic dependence, but the rest is the same, okay? Now, <clears throat> this opens somehow the uh, road <clears throat> towards studying the long time dynamics of your model, okay? So suppose that I have some operator that I want to calculate the average of, sorry. <clears throat> so I want an operator averaged over the time evolved state. Mm. Well, in principle, this object here, you see there, 
I write it as a sum over J of some time-independent constants that depend on the initial states, time e to the, the quasi-energy T minus T0, the Uj of T. Okay? You can do the same for the other thing, except that in general I have a sum over J prime. Okay? Different. Now, in principle, you might say, okay, I, I write this thing. You can, you can do it, okay? Obviously, you will recognize that there are terms with J equal to J prime, which are called the diagonal ensemble. Okay? Somehow, the phases cancel from those diagonal uh, J equal to J prime terms, okay? The remaining uh, um, average that you have is essentially, well, let me write it, the sum over J, the CJ modulus square times UJT O UJT. That's the expression you will get, okay? So notice, no time dependence from here, and the mild periodic time dependence from this diagonal expectation value, okay? So somehow this is periodic. But here there are, in principle, all J different from J prime terms with C star J prime, C J, E to the minus whatever, right? Okay? Epsilon J prime, sorry, J minus J prime. Okay? Let not me write it, because after all, this is the beast, okay? So how do we control what this does? In the long time limit, you might say, hey, but in the long time limit, these things somehow oscillate. T is large, so they oscillate fast, so maybe they go to zero. They could, they could, but it's not obvious at all. Yeah. What? You, 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 what? I, I, I missed what, the question. Here? Where? Ah, yes, yes, because there is a periodic part of the evolution. Uh, I, I erase the, I mean, if I calculate, I write it here, U of t, t0, times uj t0, okay? Remember, this is a periodic part, t, t0, times the other piece that becomes a mild phase, okay, in front, okay? And this periodic part, when applied to t0, transforms it into t, okay? So that's exactly the definition of the periodic part of the state. Okay? So in general, there is an action of the evolution also on the Floquet modes that becomes a periodic part. Okay? Sorry. I kind of missed it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> at this point, I would write, I would write a, a list of questions, issues, topics, I do it with the understanding that you do not ask questions, at least nasty questions, okay? In the sense that this opens um, lots of things that are not known, certainly not to me, but some of them I believe genuinely not known, but I think that posing those questions is useful nevertheless, okay? So, with the understanding that you, some of you have of quantum quenches, you could think of what about you know in the quantum quenches um, uh, business you ask yourself what happens if I quench my Hamiltonian would the system thermalize by itself because it's large and blah 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 now obviously here you are driving the system, it's in the microwave, so thermalization, well, 
uh, who, who knows, thermalization to what? Maybe to eat up, eating up to T, T, now unfortunately T is the period, temperature equal to infinity, okay? Maybe by just driving it long enough, your system would just reach infinite temperature. Now, for system on the lattice, which have a bounded spectrum, infinite temperature doesn't mean that the energy becomes large, but somehow there is a, a, a spread of the probability of occupying all possible in the spectrum. So, or, or maybe uh, the heating stops. Heating stops after a while. Uh, stops after a while. Okay. Because of many reasons, for instance, destructive interference. I mean, after all, this is a quantum problem, and you would probably recall that there is a phenomenon, or maybe you have heard, but never mind, it's in fact partly connected to what we say, that is called dynamical localization. Okay? It was discovered in the 80s by people working on the quantum version of the kicked pendulum. Okay, you take a classical pendulum, kicked rather than driven because it's simpler. Hmm? So you just do like this every period. Hmm? Now this is a classical model that is known that if you uh, kick too, too strongly at a certain point it becomes chaotic. Okay, so you start from a regular motion and it can become classically chaotic. Mm. Now, people, Casati and others, studied what happens due to quantum interference, and they discovered that after a while, interference effect due to quantum mechanics can actually um, somehow localize the thing. Rather than doing Brownian motion in, in, in the phase space and be fully chaotic, the system can actually stop after a while, and this is called dynamical localization. It is a time version of the localization, Anderson localization in random um, tight binding models that Anderson discovered in the 50s, okay? So, in some sense, there could be, there could be stopping of eating due to destructive interference. Obviously, the thing is related to quantum chaos, and in fact, there is a nice although not very recent review by Casati. Casati, uh, Casati and Molinari. Casati and Molinari. It's a uh, 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 critical physics supplement of 89. Okay, it's quoted in the literature of the lecture notes. Um, obviously connected to this, so uh, what is the role of this order? Okay, uh, slash this order plus interactions. Okay, well, as you know, when you have this order and interaction, interesting things can happen even outside of driving, which is called the, the many body localization. Okay. So the many-body interacting analog of the localization phenomena that Anderson discovered in single particle physics, would this be relevant to the long time dynamics of your uh, driven system? Presumably yes, but uh, I mean, it's a, a, an interesting topic of research. And then there is a connected research that is called the time crystals, okay? Uh, the question would be, can I break spontaneously the discrete time translational symmetry that H of T has? Remember, H is symmetric by translation of one period. Okay? Now, what about the time averages? Okay? What do they do? Well, presumably there will be some transient. Okay? inevitable. But after initial transit, maybe things will just settle down to something. 
And this something would, might be some periodic steady state, for instance, some diagonal kind of ensemble thing, or something different, okay? So, in principle, might be even, maybe is not periodic, okay? If it is not periodic, somehow you have effectively broken your uh, invariance of the Hamiltonian in the averages. Or maybe eventually becomes periodic after the transient, but with a different period. So the period is different from the driving period T. Can be a multiple of it. A multiple of T. Okay? For instance, 2T. This is called period doubling. Okay? So you drive at period T and your response are at period 2T. Now, in classical physics, period doubling is kind of bread and butter. Okay? So, a as a transition to chaos, system start by bifurcating and doing period doubling, and then things become more and more complicated. The name here is Feigenbaum. There is a cascade of bifurcations, and finally you get full uh, classical chaos. Now, people have worked a lot on period doubling in the time crystals, and the issue is, is in the thermodynamic limit a well-defined concepts or not, and so on and so forth. So, there are lots of things that somehow uh, originate from the long time dynamics of a driven uh, closed quantum system. And, uh, okay. Now, um, one final comment and then we st stop a little bit. What changes if I have a non-unitary dynamics? Suppose that <clears throat> the dynamics is non-unitary. Now, yesterday we started, in fact, from uh, a classical um, linearized system close to a trajectory. Hmm? Remember the pendular things. And there, <clears throat> the evolution, okay, the evolution is v dot, so this is the deviation from a certain trajectory equal to some Jacobian, which is periodic, applied to v of t, okay? So it's a set of linear differential equations, n of them, okay? So a finite space. Hmm? Uh, and then for this, obviously, you can write also the evolution operator, okay? Because the equation is linear, and therefore there must be a linear map that maps the initial value to the value at time t. Hmm? Now, this evolution operator, you can prove, satisfies essentially the whole construction that I have spelled out in the proof. Everything is precisely, or almost precisely, the same, so there is a crucial role played by this object here, the evolution operator, the classical, say, Lyapunov kind of evolution operator for one period. Mm? Uh, but the point is that somehow you can define the state, the, 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 the eigenstate of it, okay? But in principle, here, since this is not a unitary operator, the eigenvalue that you have here are complex, okay? And because of that, as you proceed applying this object, if some of these numbers are bigger than one in modulus, unfortunately, the evolution blows and your system becomes unstable, okay? So the condition for instability is that there is even one mu j whose modulus is greater than one, okay? So the system is stable only if all its eigenvalues have a modulus less than one. So inside the unit circle, the, the one in which our quasi-energies were lying, okay? Second thing, the driven, the driven uh, open quantum system that was on the board at the beginning of the lecture. So suppose that there is some Markovian description in terms of a Limbladian, so something like rho dot, 
the density matrix equal to minus i over h bar, this would be the von Neumann unitary part of the evolution. And then there is some, uh, some uh, dissipative part that is, for instance, is, is, is technically linear. The form of it, um, you could try to think of it in terms of uh, Limblad operators, so things like gamma, alpha, um, never mind for the, for the form, okay? It's important that it's linear, okay? Minus commutator, things like this, okay? So once again, a linear <coughs> differential equation for this matrices now, hmm? uh, you can in some sense define a Floquet map, so a super operator that does the evolution for you for a period, and you can try to analyze the eigenvalues of this super operator that does the evolution for one period. And once again, uh, well, typically dissipation makes things stable, uh, but there are uh, issues related to attaining a stationary limit, thermalization, and things like this. There are references that, if you want, I can give you about this. Hengi is a name that you can search, obviously, uh, for things like this. Yeah. What? Oh, in principle, this is an issue. In fact, the most general thing might have here gamma, alpha, beta, time dependent times, uh, say, operator A alpha, uh, rho, uh, A beta, uh, dagger, things like this. Usually, when this is time independent, you say this is Hermitian diagonalized by a unitary matrix, and I map into a diagonal P term like this. But in principle, this might be Hermitian, but time dependent. Therefore, there is not a unique change of basis valid for all times that make this for you diagonal. So there are issues, okay? But yeah, okay. There could be. Um, effects of time dependence in the dissipator as well. Okay, I think we should stop here for a, for a while. Uh. Okay, shall we start again? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> okay. So, so after um, this long, although not difficult, formal um, thing, let's do um, probably the, the simplest and probably instructive exercise that you can do. And there's a problem of magnetic spin resonance, okay? Now, why the simplest? Because it's a spin one half, which is the exercise number one when you do quantum things, but it's driven, okay, so my Hamiltonian is the following. There is a term uh, proportional to the Pauli matrices sigma z with this factor here, so in some sense I am having two states, the down one, okay, for instance is down, and the up state, they are separated by a splitting h bar omega zero. Okay. Now I drive the system with a perturbation that uh, couples the two spin, so some term proportional to sigma x times the cosine of omega t, and an accompanying term 
with sigma y times the sine of omega t. Okay? So it's a two by two driven system with this term in the off diagonal and this in the diagonal of the Pauli thing. Okay? Now, is this relevant to anything? Yes, it is. If you take any book on NMR, okay, this is essentially the rotating uh, magnetic field part of the NMR Hamilton, a single spin Hamilton. Okay? Why rotating? Because you see that this object that is induced by some radio frequency that they put, so there is a large Zeeman field, which is the field that they put in view when they do imaging. It's a large Zeeman field that splits the up and downs, okay? And then they put coils where they send radio frequency. This is not large, but the frequency somehow can be uh, of the order of the splitting, okay? And if there is a f matching between omega and the splitting, the radiation is absorbed by the system and then they measure, they pick up signals with things and so, so on and so forth, okay? So, um, omega, you anticipate uh, a matching h bar omega zero would actually provoke resonances in this system. In fact, there is a connected version of this problem. So I would call this the circularly polarized um, case because you see you have somehow a field. So the field is like this. There is a large field around Z and then there is a smaller field, okay, which rotates around Z with the frequency omega. You see, it rotates like cosine and sine. Okay, now there is a linear polarization version of it, which is in fact, in principle, useful as well, actually, even more useful in certain respects. Okay, so you just take this part, sigma x only, without sigma y, okay? Very closely connected. So now the field is large here, and then it oscillates linearly around x, okay? Without rotation. Okay, two versions, somewhat connected, but this is exactly solvable. This can be studied by Floquet, of course. It's a periodically driven quantum system. You can do your machinery, evolution over a period, you diagonalize. I mean, it's a kind of simple but numerical exercise in this game. This is a simple and analytical exercise that we can try to think about together, okay? So, what's the driving idea behind the fact that this is solvable? Is the fact that somehow this is rotating around the z-axis with the frequency omega, okay? So, think of the following rotation operator, which is e to the minus omega t sigma z. You remember that sigma z over 2 is actually the spin. So this is a rotation around the z-axis in spin space with this uh, angle omega times t. Okay? And indeed, you can prove that if I apply this operator to the sigma x cosine omega t plus sigma y sine omega t, okay? You can show, you always have to be careful with the sign, but I think that the signs are not wrong here, that this is simply sigma x, okay? So, in some sense, by applying this time-dependent unitary change, so by essentially moving frame that rotates around the z-axis exactly as the field rotates, I, may, I see the fields fixed, okay, around x. Hmm? Now, you might say, wait, this is not a periodic operator, so I cannot use it for the p. Why? Well, because you see that if I take t equal to um, uh, the period, t, here I have omega times t, but omega times t is pi, okay, sorry, omega times t is 2 pi, huh? but 2 pi divided by 2 is just pi, 
Okay? So this object, he, in fact, for t equal, the period is equal to minus the identity. Okay? Very little um, problem because you can actually define, now let me just, an extra phase in front, and here you have a candidate t. Okay? So, <coughs> Our candidate operator P of T, I fix T0 equal to 0. Okay, so I will not mention T0 any longer. Uh, my candidate P of T is e to the i omega T over 2 times the identity times this R of T, okay, which is the, the e to the minus sigma z that you see there. Okay, so this adds an extra factor of minus 1, which makes this object periodic. So P of zero is the identity, but also p of t is the identity, okay? Let's see mm. what happens. So, the, um, as you know, well, if I have a, a time-dependent unitary operator, I can think of changing gauge. We did it uh, in the first lecture in a context where, in principle, things were classical, and I told you, let's eliminate this object with this change of, uh, with this phase factor. Now, suppose that I define now the P of T here in front, and I define the C tilde of T, the state that somehow is related to the time evolving state by this unitary. Hmm? Then you know that the, Sch the Schrodinger equation that this object obeys has an effective Hamiltonian which is the following, P tilde dagger, the Hamiltonian times P. But there is an extra term, minus I H bar, P T dagger, P T dot. Okay? If you remember. Very good. Now, <clears throat> what about this? Well, this is simple because... <clears throat> Obviously, not only the rotation does that, but the full P does that, okay? P is essentially a rotation up to an, an overall phase factor in front, okay? So nothing really crucial. But when you apply it to sigma Z, nothing happens, okay? So this object here is simply equal to sigma Z, okay? So using these two equations, it's simple to show the first part comes h bar omega 0 over 2 sigma z untouched hmm, plus v perp divided by 2 sigma x. Okay? Because you have somehow eliminated the rotating part. Hmm? But there is this piece. Now, simple to show with this equation here. Remember, this is e to the minus i omega t over 2 times sigma z, take a derivative, it's simple to show that this is essentially minus h bar omega over 2 sigma z. There is a, an extra term which is, uh, however, quite uh, innocent in this contest, is a multiple of the identity, which in some sense, for the exercise that you are doing, we can forget about. Hmm? Okay, now, <coughs> So, this term here gives you an extra piece that is minus h bar omega over 2 sigma z. Okay? So, the two terms together indeed give you omega 0 minus omega sigma z. Okay? So, in the rotating field, in the rotating frame, sorry, what you see is a constant term in the x, because you follow it. But the term that you see in the z is not omega zero, but is omega zero minus omega. After all, you are rotating at the with the frequency omega. So the, 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 somehow the, the, the effective uh, omega that you see is omega zero minus the one that you are having, right? Okay, this is the effective frequency that you see in the z-axis. You have to subtract the velocity. It's a kind of relative velocity thing, okay? Good. So this is the transformed Hamiltonian. Notice 
it is time independent. Okay? And you can prove, it wouldn't take too long, but I don't show it, that is precisely the Floquet Hamiltonian of this problem. Okay? So this is the Floquet Hamiltonian. So obviously, in this two dimension, two, two, two by two ish, uh, thing, there are no issues related to them. I mean, it's a simple, innocent, um, fixed magnetic field spin Hamiltonian. Okay? So can I find the eigenstates? Remember, the eigenstates of this are the uj at time zero, the Floquet modes. Of course, they are the two spinners associated to this magnetic field. Okay? So let's draw, let's draw the, this magnetic field. Now, obviously, I could do the whole algebra in detail, but I don't really want, because it would be just... A, a bit annoying. I mean, if you really want, it's written in the notes. Um, but just follow the, the line of thought. It's enough. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the idea is the following. Um, I do have a magnetic field. Let's analyze this magnetic field. Okay? Uh, I can write it explicitly. So, the Hamiltonian, the Floquet Hamiltonian, is some direction n dotted into the spin Pauli operator with in front of it, however, in principle, a, um, a, an overall uh, constant, which I will call omega rabi. It's called the rabi frequency. Okay? This object here is nothing but the thing that you see there. So it's uh, h bar omega 0 minus omega divided by 2 along the z-axis, 0 along the y, and v perp over 2 along the x. Okay? So this is this vector times omega. Okay? I can calculate omega by the square root of the sum of those squares, and the direction n comes from these two things. Let's draw it. Suppose that <clears throat> the Omega is small, okay? Uh, omega small means that this is the large thing, which is in the z direction, okay? And then there is a small term here, okay? The v perp. This is roughly omega zero, okay? So the effective magnetic field that this uh, spin is seeing is almost aligned along the z axis, okay? Now, suppose that I start my experiment from the ground state. Remember, the ground state is the spin down. Okay. So is I draw the spins in blue. Okay, the spin is originally pointing down here in the z-axis, and it should evolve with this new Hamiltonian, which is, however, at a, an angle. Okay, there is an angle theta here, hmm? and you know that the spin processes. Uh, around the axis of the field. So it executes the motion, a motion on a cone, okay, around the thing in a certain direction whose sign has to be thought carefully depending on the, um, the sign of the coupling and so on and so forth. But never mind, essentially the spin processes around the uh, direction of the magnetic field. So you start from down, then you evolve a little bit, and you return down, blah, 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 blah. But as you see, if omega is small and v perp is small, essentially you are doing a small cone around the, uh, around the um, down polarization. Okay? So the spin isn't changing much. Okay? So if I ask you what is the probability, for instance, that I find the spin up at time t, which is essentially the modulus square of the up times psi of t, okay, well, that will be small because the state is almost always close to the downspin, okay? However, things change if I have now omega exactly matching omega zero. Then what you see is that this term is gone, and the spin is all along x 
here. This is the magnetic field. So what happens now is that the, the, the spin is originally here, okay? But now it will process in the zy plane with the cone that is in fact, I mean, just going like this. So it becomes up and then it becomes down again and it executes a full rotation going from down to up and to down again, okay? And keeps rotating. So if I ask you what is the probability, now P of measuring up, you would find that this probability, in fact, starts from zero, and then it reaches a maximum that is equal to one, exactly one, because you can just turn it. Hmm? And then it goes to zero again, and the period of this motion is related to this frequency here, which at resonance, you see, is essentially the VPERP, the coupling that you put. That's the reason why it's called the Rabi frequency. It's also the, ra the frequency with which the spin rotates at resonance, and you can control it. Notice, it's not related to the driving. It's not related to omega. Okay, we are at resonance here, so omega is essentially omega zero, but the frequency with which the system rotates is controlled by the coupling. Hmm? So it's not synchronous. Uh, yeah, sorry, there was a question. What? No, yeah, of, of course, well, almost no. Uh, <laughs> almost no. In the sense that you can write uh, with these ingredients and with those ingredients, with, you could write this state explicitly and you would verify that what I'm drawing is not, uh, in, I mean, it's very sensible even for intermediate times. So the spin actually processes in the way I've drawn. Okay, so yes, the evolution operator for one period is the one that you have to diagonalize to do this, but this doesn't mean that you have to look at the spin only after one period. Once you have drawn your ingredients. Yes, it does. Yeah. No, 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 it's true, it's true. I mean, I skip the algebra, I skip the algebra. <laughs> it's in the notes, it's a few lines, a bit boring. If you want, I can, I can do it, but I don't think there is any. So it's not true only at multiples of period. This is the actual physical uh, dynamics at all times that you can just settle with the periodic part and blah, 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 everything. Hmm? You can write it and you would notice that at resonance, the probability oscillate from zero to one and to zero and to one with a time essentially that is related to this Rabi frequency here. Okay? Good. So you can exactly solve this problem in all details, everything, and, and you um, notice that there is a phenomenon of resonance. Now, why um, people uh, in NMR study this? Well, first of all, because it's simpler to follow the dynamics of a spin in a rotating frame where the, the, the magnetic field evolves very little. Hmm? If you look in the lab frame, the magnetic field evolves a lot. You have to change back all your spins. And the result is that the dynamics of the spin is very complicated to look at. Here, somehow, it's mildly complicated. It's a precession around a fixed magnetic field. In the lab, it's a mess. It does things like this, okay? So NMR people don't want to really look in the lab frame. They prefer to look in the rotating frame. Now, the rotating frame exactly solves that. But suppose that you have the second problem. What do you do? Well, people do what is called the rotating wave approximation, okay? The rotating wave approximation roughly works like this. Do the same transformation, exactly the same transformation, P of T, I did to solve exactly the circularly polarized case, do it to the linearly polarized case, okay? What you do is discover the following. You do have exactly the same thing I wrote before, so H, omega zero minus omega over two, 
sigma z plus v perp over 2 sigma x. Okay? But plus, now, there is a term that, no surprise, uh, rotates backward uh, with a frequency twice omega. Okay? There is no mystery here, in fact. You can always write a linearly polarized cosine as the sum of a field that rotates in the direction I have shown there with frequency omega and another one that rotates backward with frequency minus omega. Hmm? So if you move now with frequency omega, the counter-rotating term rotates backward with frequency 2 omega. Okay? And the answer, the, the understanding is, well, this is a static piece of field. It does its job. This thing is a fast time-dependent thing because 2 omega somehow is fast. I'm at resonance, I do things, and therefore I can approximately neglect it. Okay? This neglecting things is called rotating wave approximation. Okay? Now, this sometimes applies, and in many circumstances perhaps well justified, but I should warn you, okay? If, um, if somehow um, here there is your omega zero, okay? If I am on resonance, all right. If I am beyond resonance, so omega is even larger, well, this is even more justified. Two omega is even faster. So perhaps skipping this is enough. But suppose that I am down here. Who uh, 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 somehow justifies the fact that there are no subharmonic resonances? Remember in the pendulum that we did yesterday, the approach to the omega equal to zero case was decorated by other resonances, and the resonances were essentially related to the fact that uh, n times the driving frequency was matching something. In the problem of yesterday was twice the natural frequency of the pendulum. Okay? Uh, now, in this case, if omega is small and below the thing, this oscillating things, if it is in resonance, so if there are a multiple, so somehow a multiple of the driving frequency exactly match some Floquet energy differences, then you are in danger. Okay? These are called Floquet resonances. All right? So, to, in order to see it concretely in this example, you do have to do the numerics. Okay? But interestingly, I can guarantee that there will be a decoration of resonances occurring on this problem all the way down to omega equals zero. You can have, they are called n photon resonances, so n times your driving frequency matches some frequency which is of the order of omega zero is in fact a little bit changed because of shifts, block Seeger's shifts and so on and so forth. So it's not the undriven um, uh, splitting that matters, it's renormalized by the driving itself, but uh, it occurs. So there are resonances that in this problem you will find if you study the actual Floquet dynamics in the uh, uh, non-exactly solvable linearly polarized case. Is, is it clear? Now, this again requires um, a little bit of an exercise in, so perhaps is the exercise one of a non-fully solvable analytical Floquet problem. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let me just spend the remaining 20 minutes to tell you something which will be useful tomorrow. Okay? Uh, it's again something that starts from some formal part, but then suggests a view of looking at problems, uh, driven problems, that is interesting. Okay. The starting point, again formally, is the following. You remember, it's written in fact, oh, okay, sorry, it's written here. 
okay? That these are solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger problem, okay? So if I write I h bar, the derivative with respect to time of such an object, okay? So e to the minus i epsilon j t minus t zero, okay? Uh, times u, let me write the, uh, the, the label of the Floquet mode up here because I will soon need the space here for an extra label, okay? Just don't worry about that. Okay, good. So this, okay, in principle is equal to h applied to t times the same object. So e to the minus i epsilon j t minus t0 times u j of t. And remember, this is periodic, okay? Good. So <clears throat> let's apply the derivative. You have to apply it here and here, okay? When you apply here, you bring down this factor, okay? And you get plus, the h bar goes, epsilon j, e to the minus i, epsilon j, okay, t minus t zero, times the state. All right? This is the derivative applied there. Then there is an extra term that is i, h bar, the derivative, sorry, let me put this out. Okay? And then I have i, h bar, the derivative applied inside to the u, okay? And then I have this term, which obviously you can pull the, out, out here, so I write it like this, okay? Times the Hamiltonian, u, j of t, okay? Good. Now, the phase factor has done its job, can go away, okay? Thanks for the service. And I have written a Schrodinger equation for the periodic part. If you have done solid state, you know that you can write a, a, a Schrodinger equation for the periodic part of the block wave function. It's actually useful, but never mind. This is just exactly the same transformation, by the way. Okay, so let's see what is the equation that we have written. I have written the following equation. H, bring this on the other side, minus I H bar, the derivative with respect to time applied to this periodic state uj of t is equal to epsilon j uj of t, okay? Formally, it looks like an eigenvalue problem. An operator applied to a state equal to epsilon j applied to state. Uh, notice this is u of t, not u of t zero. Mm. So this object is, has in fact uh, a meaning. It's called a K Hamiltonian. So you can do these things and do some formal manipulation in the extended Hilbert space of periodic functions, time state. There are a lot of things. Some of them are written in the notes. I don't want to enter because it would be very, very tiring. You can write a TT prime formalism. Uh, Again, I skip, there are some in the lecture notes. Doesn't really matter for my purpose. My purpose is different. This is a periodic state, okay? So as any periodic state, I can expand it, okay? So I now write U of J of T, I expand it in a Fourier series, ordinary Fourier series. So sum over M, m integers of e to the minus i m omega t times the components. The components will depend on j, but do depend also on the frequency of m, on the harmonic uh, m that I have. So these are states for each uj, an infinite number of states in principle, one for every harmonic m from minus infinity to plus infinity. I don't write the square root of two pi's because in a while I integrate, they will go away, okay? Good, so I substitute this Fourier series expansion from my periodic part of the wave function, but the Hamiltonian, remember, I forgot the t here, 
is also periodic. Okay? So why not writing also a periodic expression for this? So I would write this h of t as, again, a sum over m from minus infinity to plus infinity of some Hamiltonian m, so the Fourier component m of the Hamiltonian. I will write in a second an explicit expression, okay, times the e to the minus m, okay? What is this? Well, this is nothing but 1 over t, the integral from 0 to the period in the t prime of e to the i m omega t h of t, okay? So it's the Fourier component at frequency m omega mm, of your driven Hamiltonian. Nothing guarantees, so for instance, m equals zero is the average Hamiltonian, okay? Sometimes the average Hamiltonian is just the, for instance, if I do it there, the average Hamiltonian would be just the sigma z, right? Because when I average over a period any of those terms, I always get only sigma z. Hmm? But the component one and minus one, for instance, pick up for you the component that oscillates exactly like a sine or a cosine. So they will give you terms like those. But in principle, there is no, I mean, you don't have to choose a perfect periodic cosine driving. Could be any period. So in principle, this could have any Fourier component. Okay? So you put them all there. Hmm? And you substitute here hmm? and this for the state. And then you take the derivative. The derivative acts where? It acts here, obviously. Okay? So sh shall we do the algebra? Kind of. I don't want to really... Um, uh, make your, uh, I mean, we want to stop for lunch also, and I don't want to do too long a story. It's very simple algebra. So if you substitute those um, expressions that I wrote, and then you integrate, you multiply by an appropriate e to the i m omega, and you integrate over time, you single out, the component m on the right hand side. So on the right hand side you would find epsilon j u j m, okay? By just multiplying by e to the i m and integrating over time. Now on the left you would obtain something like this, sum over m prime of h of m prime Okay, time acting on u j m minus m prime, but there is also a term that is minus m h bar omega times u j of m. Okay, let's look at this problem. Uh, it looks like a kind of tight binding problem, okay? So I have extended my state into a one-dimensional lattice where the lattice index is the Fourier index, okay? So here I have my m, so 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, okay? So for each one of those m labels, I do have a state, okay? And there is a non-site energy term, okay, which is, you see, proportional to omega, and if you draw it, it's like this, okay? So here is zero, but for instance, here is positive, and this difference is h bar omega, and this is twice h bar omega, and so on and so forth. So if you think of this as a tight binding lattice, you realize that this is kind of an electric field, a uniform electric field with a scalar potential that makes the system more and more happy if it is there. But, but don't think in terms of ground state. I 
I'm not looking for the ground state of this tight binding things. I'm looking for this eigenvalue problem. Hmm? Obviously, and I will discuss this, you can, if you find the solution of this, you can translate it everywhere you want by an integer multiple of m omega, because we discussed that there is this indeterminacy of things, okay? So, whenever you find a solution, always remember that I can translate it. This is the analog of what is called the Vanier-Stark ladder in the problem of a particle in a tight binding potential with an electric field, okay? So, it's a very famous problem. This is almost the same problem, okay? Almost because, well, it's not a single particle. Here, you have a Hilbert space. On top of every uh, uh, site, you should think of having a full tower of states, okay? Because, after all, these are the Fourier components of your state in the Hilbert space. So, in principle, there, well, a tower. For the problem that you have there, only two, in fact. So the tower reduces to two. Hmm? But if you have here, say, an harmonic oscillator, well, there is an infinite sequence. If I have a square well, then there is an infinite sequence with not equidistant thing. If I have a nitrogen atom, I have an infinite sequence of discrete and then a continuum, a nightmare, hmm? because of something that I will tell you in a second. Can play a horrible game. Okay, never mind. Let's not run too fast. Hmm? So I discussed this term, which is a kind of linear Van Niestark like electric field. And what about this? Well, these are hopping matrix elements that connect states on the neighboring Fourier points. Okay? You see the Hamiltonian, the M component of the Hamiltonian uh, connects the state M with the state M minus M prime, where M prime is the index of your Fourier thing. Okay? This is interesting because, because of the following. Okay, so let's, mm, let's uh, uh, reanalyze our solvable problem uh, in the light of this theme, okay? Which tomorrow I will use to discuss other things. For instance, how you get the Haldane topological insulator model by driving a graphene, okay? So we'll see how useful this scheme of thought is to think about uh, how to induce non-trivial topology into things that are trivial if undriven, okay? So, more about this tomorrow, but let's finish this kind of simple exercise. So, <clears throat> what you would do around, uh, about this if you had the first problem in your hands? Then you would say, okay, let me calculate this um, HM things. Well, nothing could be simpler, in fact. I can give you the expression. The the secretly polarized case, the HM is the following. So, if M is zero, so the average is just sigma Z, I told you. So, it's H bar omega zero over two times sigma Z. Okay? Now, if M equal, is equal to minus one, then you can show that you have v perp over 2 times sigma minus. Okay? It's not difficult. You just have to integrate cosine and sine both with the harmonic with the minus 1 here, and you will discover that you get sigma minus. And then you get the emission conjugate, which is sigma plus times the delta of m plus 1. Okay? So let's do our drawing. I do it like this. Imagine that I have here a cosine potential, just to pursue the analogy with the tight binding Vanier 
stark ladder problem, okay? Unfortunately, the drawing is not very nice, but so this is m equals zero. And here I have two states, okay, separated by h bar omega zero, okay? These are the two eigenstates of this h zero thing. Hmm? Now, remember, the slope of this thing is uh, h bar omega, the driving. Hmm? Now, suppose that omega is exactly equal to omega zero. You are on resonance, okay? So, these two states, when you draw them here, so this is, remember, the down, and this is the up. When you draw them here, they are shifted upwards by exactly omega, but omega is omega zero. So, the down ends up here, and the up ends up there, shifted by h bar omega zero. But you see, since this energy here is omega and is equal to omega zero, this is in fact in resonance with this, okay? And this is exactly the thing that the Hamiltonian does for you couple, because you see, I can take a spin up and with sigma minus, I couple it to the spin down. This is down, remember, and this is up again, okay? So you see that this sigma minus term is exactly what I have here, okay? The emission conjugate term is exactly the opposite. So I can take the down term here and transform into an up term uh, in the plus one thing, which is, remember, zero, this is minus one, and this is plus one, and so on and so forth. So it ends up that the Hamiltonian only couples these two states together. And what about the other? Well, they are coupled in pairs. So these two are coupled. Then again, these two are coupled. These two are coupled. And so on and so forth. Now, you realize that your tight binding two-level problem in an electric field reduces to a system of molecules, okay? The down and the up at different frequencies, which are in this drawing at different lattice points, couple together, but they don't care about this other two, this other two. What are they? The repetitions at multiples of uh, the driving frequency, which respects the, remember, the epsilon j, epsilon j plus m h bar omega. So the ladder, the Van Niestark ladder, obviously uh, suggests that you can repeat this thing everywhere. It would be totally equivalent. But the message is that I was able to solve everything because in this tight binding thing, the problem was not an infinite lattice, but rather a two by two problem, which I can solve. Now, <clears throat> suppose that I turn on the other piece, sorry, I mean, I just uh, switch off the sigma y, I, I take just a linearly polarized thing. Then what is the linearly polarized um, uh, hm? Well, same term, this is exactly the same, okay? But this changes, okay? It becomes the following. It becomes v perp over two sigma x times the delta of m plus one plus the delta of m minus one. This seems like a minor change because after all, you still couple um, essentially near, ne nearest neighbor lattice points in Fourier space, but with sigma x, which means that now, I draw it in blue, for instance, I have a coupling between this and and, 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 so let me just the drawing so that I don't tell you nasty things. So for instance, take this object here and couple to that object, okay? Down to up. I can do it. Uh, 
not only, I mean, because sigma x couples me, you might say, but this is not a resonance. In fact, this is twice omega, okay? But yet, they are coupled. So in some sense, the lattice now becomes a full lattice. So I have a, a true one-dimensional lattice problem to solve, which obviously is not just a simple two-by-two two molecule problem, okay? Uh, now you might say, okay, good, I now understand that well, but now, think about, I was discussing the Floquet resonance story before. Now, suppose that you make omega smaller than uh, omega zero. Hmm? Then maybe this is omega zero, and this is not on resonance. So here I have, so because omega is less than omega zero. So there is no longer a resonance between these two as here. Okay? But suppose that Omega is half omega zero, okay? Omega is equal to omega zero half, okay? Then every two things, these two objects will be in resonance, okay? You see? And since they are coupled, although to second order, they will see each other, okay? And this is a resonance. But this is not the only one. Suppose that I have omega, uh, omega zero divided by n, okay? Then, to n order in perturbation theory, you will see a distant neighbor, okay? So this is a small thing, but in principle, if you integrate the thing for an infinite time, this resonance will grow up and in the end will change your state, okay? So somehow it shows that this decoration that I was talking in the first lecture about the limit going to omega to zero being a delicate thing full of resonance actually emerges from this picture in a quite apparent way. Okay? So going to the limit of omega going to zero somehow eliminates the electric field. It looks like a, a simple extra dimensions that you have given to your system. Okay? If you think of the Fourier space as an extra dimension, this is interesting because people look for artificially increasing the dimension of a quantum problem. Because you know that, for instance, quantum all effect four dimension is different than in two dimension. There is a second uh, churn invariant, for instance. But four dimension is half. Okay? Usually you have two and three. Mm. In three, there is no all effect, because in two, there is the usual one. So it would be nice to artificially increase the dimensionality of a system. Hmm? Now, a standard tool is to use internal spin or pseudo spin degrees of freedom of your uh, um, particles in the optical lattice, just to make uh, things uh, clear. Okay, so if you use the, that label as an extra dimension, hmm, and people here at Lens are, uh, have done lots of things in this, you can, in fact, do ladders. In fact, not an infinite dimension, but you can do ladder uh, of objects, and you can induce artificial gauge fields through laser, smart moves, uh, and somehow you have a quasi two-dimensional uh, non-trivial because of the artificial gauge um, physics, okay? Now, the frequency is somehow a possible extra dimension, okay? So if omega is small, this is kind of a zero electric field, and you are approaching omega equal to zero, so why not saying that the single spin one-half now is a one-dimensional chain? Well, kind of. Okay? You have to watch out for those resonance. How do we actually approach the adiabatic limit, omega going to zero, uh, uh, in this one-dimensional picture? Not trivial. Okay? So it's one of the issues behind this increasing dimensionality through this uh, tool. Okay? So tomorrow we will continue the discussion starting essentially from here to point out a few things that people have looked, which I know uh, 
I mean, I know a few things that I myself have done, a few things that are in the literature. I will point out some things that people do, okay? The field is kind of very active, but I cannot give you a picture because there is no unifying picture so far. I mean, there are bits and pieces of things, interesting at times. Some of them I know, some of them I don't know. So I will give you some hints tomorrow. Okay, I think we can stop here today. Mm -hmm.